Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 134, recorded on 17 July 2013. We're your dose for everything geeky, and in the show today, we're talking about Norway and how they've reduced piracy over the last few years, the Pixar theory, get your turn four hats on, and simplifying geolocation with three simple words. Thank you for joining us. In the show with me today is Luke Portriter. Hello. Hello, Luke. Mixing the show, Annie Vermeulen. Hello. I'm Jan Vermeulen. And Luke, what manner of geek are you? I am a, well, like an everyman's geek, geek I suppose. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm into like phones and gaming and tech and mechanical and engineering and biology and <laughs> so everything. Cool but all, all the things. All the things. <laughs> Annie, what manner of geek are you? Um... Uh, space geek, photography geek. Uh, yeah. I can't think of anything else right now. <laughs> Gaming, books, music, videos. All kinds of geekery. All, all the things. All the things. I'm Jan Vermeulen. I am a writer for my broadband at Zero Zero, and I guess that makes me a telecommunications and gadget geek. That's what I tend to spend most of my time on, and it's where most of my knowledge lies. So when it's coming out of my mouth, it's probably got to do with how much you're paying for your bits and bytes and lines and things and stuff. Technical terms. Things all those that things. affect us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can catch a live video stream um, if you're watching this pre-recorded pre-recorded i hate that word if you're watching the recording of this the podcast the video podcast or, or listening to the audio podcast um you can actually join us live we stream these out live on a wednesday evening south african time we usually start at around eight we try to have the stream up by seven thirty. windows willing and um, windows willing. <laughs> and uh and yeah so and we've got an rc channel you can come and whinge at us on there and you can also whinge at us on twitter at let's talk geek and uh, you can email us anything at l at uh, let's talk network tv, and we'll pick that up, and uh, we can talk about it in the show. Cool, cool. Into the random, we start every show with a bit of a random. And Luke, you picked something that's a little um, o- off of our normal random tradition, but I'll allow it because it's just too awesome. Well, I picked up that it's Cory Doctorow's birthday today, and he will be forty-two. Yep. And I know he's the important. Answer. But I'm not entirely sure why. Okay, so <laughs> Cory Doctorow to us to us writery types, um, he's he's uh, you know he's quite well known because mm. he's a he's not just a, an activist and a blogger, but he's also a, a writer of fiction and nonfiction. So Cory Doctorow is probably best known for his uh, anti copyright like, yeah, advocacy. Yeah, rants. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and and he's very interesting to to listen to, uh, regardless of which side of the fence you you sit on this, or if you're on the fence for that matter. Um, so talking about copyright, DRM. And uh, what the the anti copyright lobby would call the copyright monopoly. Um, so ah, yes. very interesting stuff. And a um, couple of books you can catch his book right now. In fact, uh, one of his books um, in the humble ebook bundle. Um, pay what you want, and you get a bunch of DRM free books. Very nice. Uh, yeah, includes so, books by Will Wheaton. Yeah, so Will Wheaton's there. Corey Doctorow's there, and. Uh, and, and it's not just that. I think there are about like seven or eight books in, in the Humble ebook bundle, and it's running out. Uh, I think there's only a couple of days left on that. A couple of hours, probably. Uh, no, it should be about two more days, if I've counted correctly. I'll check now. Google is my friend. Um, Google food. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's Corey Doctorow. Happy birthday. Happy 42nd birthday, in fact. And there are only four hours left. So if you're watching this live, the mixer was right, and Five you need hours. to order right now, which is what I'm going to do right after the show. Go All right. Go. Uh, with that, we're going to go into our Quick Geek, this is where we spend no more than two minutes on a topic. The mixer keeps us in line and at her discretion may award points for the most interesting person in She's the Quick waving Geek. waving her fingers I at us. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I call hacks. Yeah. Bias. Uh, Bias. My discretion. C- citation needed. <laughs> uh, and uh, a, a comment uh, w- at the start of the Quick Geek uh, from Paul Huell. Um, this is relating to our random earlier in the show <laughs> that, a, that a journalist is just a broke geek. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Sounds oh, about right. All right. So um, I think uh, in the past week, it's uh, Area Velo win the Sikorsky Prize for a human-powered helicopter, for winning the human-powered helicopter challenge. Luke, you popped this in the show notes. Um, uh, I thought this was interesting. Uh, so the Sikorsky Prize, as far as I can tell, was set up in the 1980 or so. And uh, 
they cha- they they posited a challenge for anyone to make their own human powered aircraft. Now, if we just quickly get the uh, notes up, yeah. Um, and the challenge has to do with uh, you know p- uh, having a helicopter f- entirely under human uh, power, and it must hover for at least ten meters above the ground. Oh, sorry. Three meters, it says 10 foot, so I got confused. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in a space of 10 by 10 meters, which means you, you have to have control, and this is very important. So, yeah, you can't, like, yes. swerve out of control. Yeah. Or you it can't just, a- you know, float up and float down and hope you land in the correct zone. That's not going to get you the prize. And so, this is a pretty old, um, you know, event. challenge. Challenge, yeah. yeah. So, um, these guys called Area Velo have won it. Um, the video for this thing is fantastic. Uh, we'll bomb if you're watching the, the, the video the stream right now, yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll bomb some links in. But if you're watching the video stream right now, you'll see what seems to be the testing area. What I like so much about this this craft is that when you watch how slowly the wings on this thing move, it's just it's amazing ridiculous. to watch. It's ridiculous. It's it's how fantastic. How does it stay in the air? And uh, there's a whole bunch of bunch of sciencey stuff to relate to that exactly. Um, there's a whole bunch of like air forces and fluid dynamics and so on. So that guy really, that pilot, let's call him, has to got to do a lot of work to stay in place and to land gently and all of these things. So it's it's quite damn fantastic to watch. Mm-hmm. So um, this is not something that's going to become like a mass market well, human no. power flight machine. I, I doubt it. Because, because it's a little a hard to operate. Well, no. If, I it's think very if you niche. take a look at the, at the image, you'll see that it's... It's huge. It's huge. Okay. It's absolutely huge. Um, and I guess, yeah, what you, what you lack for in wing movement, you have to make up for in wing span. Yeah. I, w- I would also think that like any kind of subtle breeze would just knock you out of the sky anyway. Yeah, as, okay. as is, this, uh, there's no actual sort of controls, um, gyroscopic controls on this thing. Yeah. The, the guy, you know, he, he takes off and then he's, he starts to drift a little off to the one side, but he's still inside the area they have to stay in. And the only thing he can do to try to counter that is physically lean with his body. Just like a motorcycle. This is the to, to motorcycle of heli- just helicopters. A little bit, just a little bit of weight on that end, so maybe it tilts just a little, so maybe it comes back. But he, he doesn't actually control it um, directionally. It was all about getting it off the ground and staying off the ground yeah. for at least, or at least a minute. Yes. Yeah, they had to stay in the, in the air for at least a minute between certain heights and within a square. So it's just ridiculous. Those, 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 those blades turn like this. Wow. Like impressive. Really but this is also good. another, you know, the the goodness of Kickstarter because these guys started off with a Kickstarter of thirty thousand dollars and that's what they managed to crank out at the end. Uh, well, it's 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 partially used in the creation of their uh, flying machine, but uh, you know Kickstarter seems to be all for good things. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool and pretty selfless of the the people who Kickstarted it. I think because yeah. I can't think that yeah, you're going to no, get a share there's of that nothing that you can get out of that. But yeah. yet people Ex- accept something awesome. In. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, that's pretty cool. With that. Uh, um, Talking about uh, Kickstarter and the revolutionizing of uh, <laughs> of the online marketplace, um, piracy in Norway um, has collapsed, according to Tor- Torrent Freak, who does tend to use uh, powerful words like collapsed. Um, <laughs> in, in stories, I would say probably uh, reduced, <laughs> yes, if at all. Um, but uh, still remains a very valuable source of information with regards to what's happening in the copyright lobby and the content industry in the world. So big ups to Torrent Freak. And um, so what's interesting here that they've highlighted is that Norway, and, it, and it's actually sad to see because the Scandinavian countries used to be very progressive when it came yes. to copyrights and very human open. rights and, and, and that sort of thing. And um, the entertainment industry groups in Norway, they report, um, have spent years lobbying for tougher anti-piracy laws and have now recently got them through. And um, however... Um, a, a, an investigation into what's been happening in piracy in Norway has revealed that over the last four years or so, five years even, um, the amount of pirated movies, music, and uh, and TV shows ha- has just, uh, well, maybe collapsed is not an unfair word, especially when you look at the music graph. Um, it's reduced, and uh, it, it's not anti-piracy campaigns. I mean, let's, let's be real about this yeah. for a second. I mean, I mean, even if we bring it locally again i mean like dstv where they're trying to have the lead time between the release in the u.s and the lead release to here to shrink that gap just so that well then people won't have to resort to alternative media to get the content exactly you know? and and uh, and it's and it's uh, maybe a bit harsh for the people who pay top dollar to sure. to bring content legitimately to audiences but the fact is your competition 
is a bunch of geeks who who are giving it away for free online um within and, hours of the show yeah even. A- and it's incredibly convenient yes um so you know the the download speeds are fast if you've got a fast line because it's downloaded over multiple streams and so on and so forth um you've got to compete with that so yes. uh assume that zero rand at incredibly high download speeds is your competition and do better um maybe you know obviously you can't give it away free but you can improve on service uh you know there's so many ways that that you can actually compete with that and and guys have done that effectively and and apple has actually shown the I yes. think the music industry that it is possible to sell music, yeah, and and convince people to spend money on it. If if you make the content available in a reasonable time frame at a reasonable cost, and it's easy for people to access, then it is going to d- dissuade them from downloading it instead. But this also links with that whole uh, you know piracy is not necessarily a lost sale. I mean, you might still have watched a pirated media and say, okay, I like the show a lot. I'll go and buy the, the, the DVD or whatever and get the ex- additional content as well. I, that can happen, although I'd say that in, in, most, in most cases, you know, you've watched something once or you've downloaded it once, you're not going to make the effort to go out unless it's something really special to you. Yes. I mean, we're, we're planning to go see Pacific Rim. Right. That's only opening in two and a half weeks. It's already showing it, in the US, right? Yes, and, and people are talking about it and I've been talking to people about it and, and I'm, I'm like... Why am I going to wait two and a half weeks and pay a lot of money to go to a movie theater? Because at the moment, all you would see is a shocking handicam video <laughs> of the footage. Yeah, right now. <laughs> yeah. but, but, you know, in, in a couple of days, there's probably going to be a high quality rip out. That's true. Why would I wait? From a monster well, disc. Or, or a telesync, yeah, or a telesync rip, or a, yeah. or a screener or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. It's uh, just, th- yeah. <laughs> because for it's those kinds tempting. of movies, you want to see it on the big screen, though. I, I'm not a fan of big screen. Oh. Okay. I actually don't like going to the cinema. I prefer to watch something at home. So for me, fair enough. Yeah, and it's very tempting. Uh, and yeah, and uh, and three D also. We're not huge fans oh, of that. I but hate 3D. but uh, I hope yes, you can gimmick. get you can get this and not three D. Um, I'm going to move us along. NASA. Annie, I assume, <laughs> being <laughs> a resident space geek, has discovered something pretty cool. What's going on here? <coughs> cough switch. Sorry, we don't have cough switches. <laughs> Um, all right, so, so this, was, <laughs> this was pretty exciting for me. Um, I actually ran acri- across it this morning. Neptune has a 14th moon. Um, That's a lot of moons. <laughs> that is a lot of moons. Um, That's so, also puny. Yeah, so what's happened is over the last – now you moved my thing around, so now I don't know where it is anymore. Nice. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right, so there's this guy called Mark Showalta. He's an astronomer with SETI, and he has been looking um, at photographs of uh, Neptune, and it's – planets, um, its moons, and its rings that were taken over a period between 2004 and 2009, approximately 150 images. And because um, Neptune spins very fast and all of the moons around it rotate incredibly quickly, um, they developed a new method for for tracking the motion of the rings and the moons as they go around. And so using this new method, he sat down and he's like, hmm, I see this white little this little white dot over here. I think you can see it in the image. I must see this little white dot. I'm going to apply this new method to this little white dot and see what its motion is. And it turned out to be a 14th moon. So, so randomly tracking pixels on a screen can pay off. Well, I yeah. mean, it's, it's again like whenever they tell you, oh, they found a well. planet here on this distant star. Uh, Wow, how long did you have to stare at that spot for? You know, I mean, these guys make lifetime careers out of watching very limited <laughs> spots in space. Well, but if you if you now if you take a look at some of the stats he came out, first of all, it's approximately sixty five thousand four hundred miles out from Neptune. That's that's wow. very far out. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's between two other known moon orbits, Larissa and Proteus, and it goes around Neptune once every twenty three hours. So that gives you an idea of, of how fast that thing is moving and how fast everything in that system moves. So, Have they named it? At the moment, it's designated S slash 2004N1, but hopefully it'll get a, a better name soon. Cool name. I see that, that Neptune has some cool names, so hopefully it'll stay themed. Yeah, it, look, it takes a while for, for new names to be agreed on. Um, and literally, this guy discovered it on July 1st. Okay. And NASA made the announcement yesterday mm. after they confirmed it. So. Uh, they cool. just need to stick with the gods of old theme. I like that more than whatever anyone else comes up with. <laughs> well, I mean, some of the other moons are named Galatea, Despina, Thalassa, Larissa, Larissa, Proteus. So, 
It'll it probably be something Something dramatic. awesome. Yes. All right. All right. It's time to don your tinfoil hats. The Pixar theory. Um, so Annie uh, found this, I think. So, so yeah. Annie should be the one to take us through it. But this is, this is quite interesting. It, it's basically a theory that says that the whole of the Pixar universe is tied together in a single thread. All of the characters from every Pixar movie ever made lives in the same universe. It's a single universe. So if you're thinking, we're right. talking here, we're talking Monsters, Inc., Buzz Lightyear, Cars, Finding Nemo. It's not Buzz Lightyear, up. it's Toy Story. Toy Story. Um, <laughs> it's not the Buzz Lightyear up, story. Cars, yes, it is. <laughs> Wally, um, Brave, and all of those. And Finding Nemo. I said Finding Nemo. Oh, my bad. Um, those story about fish finds in the same universe. In as, the same universe. Yeah. And so there's this guy really? who has taken a lot of time to go through through all of the different characters and all of the different movies and tie them all together into one grand theory. And he's got some really good, um, I don't know what to call him. He, he makes a really good case yes. for a few of them. And, and I don't want to spoil it entirely because people should go and read it. Yeah. But I am going to say there's one thing. If you've watched Brave, and Brave is a great movie, you will notice the witch in Brave in her, in her little cabin, there are wooden engravings. And, and one of the wooden engravings is of Sully. And Sully is the giant blue monster from, from Monsters, Monsters, Inc. Monsters Inc. Yeah. And there's also, there's, there's also a little truck that comes from another movie. Well, it, it makes it into almost all the movies. The Pizza Planet truck. The Pizza yeah, Planet yeah, truck. it's almost in every the, movie. The, yeah. the, 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 BN, the by and large B&L logo appears in a lot of places, it's But it's surely that's just in jokes. I mean, <laughs> that's could you really tie it all together? <laughs> I was also wondering, is it, is it not just a whole bunch of Easter, Easter eggs? eggs or, yes. But he makes a relatively convincing argument for, for how all the universes you know, fit yeah. together into one. But, but perhaps, um, yeah, and, and I guess the argument to be made here is that perhaps the, 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 just the, amount, thinking. Yeah, <laughs> the amount of thought that Pixar went into when they put these Easter eggs in might not be quite as much <laughs> as I mean, we have put into put, trying to put it all together. I mean, if Toy Story came out in, like, 95, I mean, you're telling me that back in 95, they decided that they're going to have this epic arc story. <laughs> no, but they could have they could have decided only after Toy Story 1, in fact. So, that, because Toy Story right, 1 is the first one. Because you have to have one. success first. Yeah, yeah and, right. then they're like, and then they make another one one and then they realize oh, this could be fun <laughs> and they run a common yeah. thread through them all maybe yeah. <laughs> it's, it's worth it's worth going to read in a couple of places it's a it's a little thin but uh, but overall it's you're like whoa and there's lots of easter eggs that you would not have noticed yourself so yeah so this guy spent a lot of time so i think j just for the time he spent it's worthwhile to go check out his blog post um that'll be in the show notes by the way so if you if you're what if you're watching this Online or on YouTube, or you are um, listening to the podcast, you can grab the show notes off our blog, ltg. Uh, let's talk network or dot tv or ltnet tv. Um, then the WTF story <laughs> of the week um, is a man is suing Apple for his porn addiction. A lawyer, I might add. Um, I Luke had missed that point in the story, <laughs> but that that now makes it more sensical, I guess. <laughs> Luke, uh, you, you came, you you put the story in the show notes. So, um, uh, what did you? <laughs> what's going on here? Oh my word! Okay, so I'm going to start with a face palm. Okay, and and so this wonderful soul um is deciding to sue apple over the using well the use of his macbook pro i can't quite yes yes yeah. and uh he's saying that apple is liable for his browsing because they didn't try and stop him from going to uh offensive sites let's call them um <laughs> and so he's suing them because he got addicted to the content on this particular site and uh he feels that well Seeing as his wife and children have left him and he's now you know, destitute without them, uh, that Apple is Apple liable for, is li liable yeah. for that. So, so, what's uh, so what's interesting here, uh, I d from from what I've uh, pieced together about this story, um, the the guy apparently uh, was using a site that ends in a book but doesn't start with face. Yes, um, and uh, he accidentally replaced yeah. the Who letters. Who does that? <laughs> That's my first thought. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he mistyped Facebook and ended up on this other book social network. Yes, and what? Accidentally uh, created a, a profile, and you, his you wife have accidentally to log into discovered that it. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. My, my my favorite part of the story is he claims that before he got the Mac, he had never been exposed to porn. 
But what makes this now even worse is that in his 50-page diatribe uh, filing, uh, he goes on to discuss a whole bunch of stuff in the, in the sense that, oh, porn is an industry, is killing America, and so on. And um, he even manages to confuse himself apparently within the <laughs> so <laughs> within in the, the filing yeah yeah so uh, i mean it, it's if this it goes to trial it's going to be an interesting case nonetheless because basically what the guy is asserting is that apple and by extension then everyone else because what applies to apple should surely apply to everyone else yes yeah, sure um should basically ship their machines in like a lockdown safe mode and if you want to access you know over 18 content or whatever the case might be you have to physically say cool unlock the stuff i am willing to see this now but then i mean like who's going to be the regulating authority behind that kind of stuff who's going to then stop you say oh no you haven't clicked the agree button yet and then doesn't that still put you in the same permission so you've you've hit the agree button and now it's meaningless yeah right? exactly so, uh, and, 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 and are the warnings on the site's not good enough if yes. you do that with 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 apple and Apple devices, you're going to have to do that with every single device that can connect to the internet. Why, why do desktop PCs not ship? Smart you know, TVs. Why do, why do browsers, why does Chrome, when you download and install Chrome, it not automatically install in safe yeah. mode? Consoles, no, all kinds no. of stuff. My anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, staying with the United States, um, <laughs> they have recognized esports players as pro athletes. Um, Luke, what's this about? So and what does it mean for them? Apparently, if you are an esports player, Athlete. I'm going to use this term loosely because it really feels weird. But okay. Well, if golf is a sport. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> golf actually involves going outside. Yeah, it's, it's a good walk spoiled, I agree. But uh... uh, Spoiled to say. <laughs> but anyway, um, so apparently the U.S. is notoriously difficult to get into because if you say on your you know, application to enter the U.S. that you're saying, you know, I'm coming here to play games, uh, they apparently – Stay you down the, and look funny. Oh, does the customs uh, officer go, uh, uh, go home? Friend? Yes, pretty much. <laughs> so what this means is that, well, for start, uh, competitive gameplay, at least, uh, is notching it up, I would say. Because if you're making it easier to do so, it's going to become more popular. So clearly, this is taking off. It's becoming a great money spinner. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a StarCraft player, I'm jealous of these people. <laughs> because I know I'll never be able to compete at that level, but it's still fun as hell. But in any case, um, I think what this means for everyone else is, well, it makes competing easier for a start. So you might not necessarily have to join a, a team of pro athletes or anything like that. You can just go, mm. uh, declare you're an esports person and you're part of this league and so on. So uh, The thing is, esports were, was, were, was recognized um, pr previously – and even in South Africa, we've got you know esports recognized, but, uh, but what's different you were about not this, labeled as a professional athlete. But that's now the difference: is yes. that because you now have this labeling, uh, yeah. you are recognized as going into a competitive sport. Yeah. So you gain entry a lot easier. So I did want to mention that um, uh, previously when we had James Etherington Smith on the show from My Gaming, uh, he ran us through how Mind Sports South Africa um, ha ha is now considered in Category 1 by SASCOC. That's a South African Sports Confederation and Olympic Committee. Um, and so uh, according to them, that puts um, esports in South Africa treated E or that will mean that esports in South Africa will be treated equally among Olympic disciplines. So also, um, uh, that's not professionalism. That's Olympics. That's yes. it's a different. It's a different. But I would uh, say that also entirely, opens up the world official. to things like colors for esports and the, you know, yeah, national the, recognition. Yeah, the MSSA had that already. So okay. so the the Olympic thing. Um, it, it, James explained it better, and I think yes. I'm just going to refer back to that show rather than hashing over the the, the whole thing again. So, um, but the bottom line is, is it it does look like. Yeah, uh, it, it's opening it's opening doors, and uh, what could happen, I guess, is um, make it easier for somebody like, let's say, from South Africa, where it might be a little trickier to compete internationally. Um, right. Not because uh, our our quality is bad down here, but maybe because uh, connecting to those servers, the latency is yes, bad. Yes, it's yes. difficult to compete. Now you can relocate to the states, compete against those people in the states where the latency isn't such an issue. Could well, be interesting. Also, the, the pro leagues, they always set up like uh, self-standing lands or the equivalent thereof. So you would have to travel there to, to compete at a ma major league anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I interesting. Think, I think that the, the difference is purely in the title. Y you are now considered yes. to be a professional athlete. As well, it sounds to cool. <laughs> as opposed to being just a professional gamer previously, yes. it's now considered an, an, a well, form of 
a form of athletics. It's a dif- the difference between a streamer and someone who competes, I would say, uh, because streamers could be good at their content, but they might not have that recognition, or they might not be good enough. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know. So you you're you're basically honoring these other guys in a different way. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Um, now back. To, also interesting. This is sort of tying in with what we spoke about earlier with a with a Pixar story, a unified timeline of fiction. Annie, you came across this. Was it because of the Pixar story that you no. came across this? No, this was this was Reddit actually. Um, ah, good old Reddit, the <laughs> gold mine. <laughs> but yeah, so this is this is very similar. Um, what these guys are doing though is they are trying to put together an. It's an attempt to bring together every piece of fiction ever into a comprehensive universe that combines elements from fiction and history from any and all genres, cultures, and time periods. So, so what they've done oh um, is they've put together this unified timeline of fiction. And it's split up you know, from 4 billion years ago to zero, zero to 1500s to the 1900s. Um, and then, you know, t- 2000s and beyond. And the, 19, the, the 1900 to 1999 timeline culminates in the Matrix. Must be. S- uh, well, that's 97, <laughs> so it starts there at the very least. So, <laughs> and so what they've done is in there, they put in, in chronological order events from multiple different universes. And in some cases, they've even tied them together. So, so for example, um, it's, it spans the history of the Earth. It starts at the point 4.6 billion years ago when the Earth is formed with a Ragnar spaceship at the center, which is from Doctor Who. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And then it reads all the way through to current era events, for example, where Buffy defeats Dracula, Chell destroys GLaDOS, the Umbrella Corporation destroys Raccoon City, the SGC mounts a one-way expedition to the Pegasus Galaxy, all the way through the events of The Matrix, Total Recall, Star Trek, Firefly, Mass Effect, Halo, the Gundam series, Futurama, Avatar, right through to the last recorded fictional events of the year 4126 when the Doctor frees the Ood from slavery. What, what about, um, the, does the Doctor Who uh, franchise not determine when the end of Earth is? Is, okay, is there a specific yes. year associated with that? Yes, there is. There is the end of the, you know, the day the Earth is destroyed. Yes. But there are other events that happen beyond that in the Doctor Who timeline and those are included. So it's not, I suppose it's not just the history of Earth, but it's Earth fiction. Earth related fiction. Okay. Because that would be my next question would be like, well, doesn't Doctor Who manage to go to the end of the universe anyway? Doesn't that include? But if it's only Earth fiction, then, then that's fine. <laughs> so, so, yeah, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's incredible. So in some, it's one massive timeline, right? And, and my head wanted to explode just, just reading through the different this is like the best geek wiki well, ever created. It, it's like, a, do I know these things? Oh, I've never come across this series before or this, this thing. Is like, exactly. This is yeah. like TV exactly. tropes on steroids. Yes. I'm oh. just never going to be productive again. So, so what happens is in a variety of different places, they take fictions from different universes and different um, shows and they actually you know, link them together in places where it makes sense. What about um, storybook fiction? So adding in Stephen King and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm sure they must have. Any and all fiction. So if, if, you, if there's something that's not in there that you think should be in there, you send it to them and they add it. And so it's kind of like a you know, community-based What about community parallel Earths? Thing. Um, like in Sliders. But, but the, again, you've got, you've got a <laughs> they, covered they've Stargate. Got, they've, got, they've got bits where they say you know, alternate, but, you know, alternate ending to this particular story. Or and what about the debates about which one is alternate and which one is the real world? <laughs> but, but so, for example, some of them are, yes. some of them are pretty insane. Right, so if you go take a look, you'll find out, for example, Lady Gaga's music videos. Right, what? she usually has she usually has stories. There's, there's a story yes. in each music video, and several of her music videos repeatedly tie into the Men in Black. <laughs> oh, for <laughs> the <laughs> love of uh, Right, and then there's others. That's a bit abstract. <laughs> there's others that make sense. For example, um, Portal and iRobot um, getting threaded together because they're f- occurring roughly the same time space and, and on the same it, it's um, incredible and in other I don't places, mind Asimov and Portal being linked together that sounds great I'm quickly looking here at the um, the sources list and they do include books yeah. and in basically any media as far as I can see that's awesome well staying with the awesomely nerdy uh, let's talk about food <laughs> so another <laughs> one of Annie's passions a uh, YouTube channel dedicated to the making of nerdy baked goods yep this sounds awesome so what we're we having for supper <laughs> <laughs> What's for supper? <laughs> so I only discovered this yesterday, and I was like, "How have I not known about it before now?" Um, I'm a, I'm a big baker. I like I like baking baking cakes um, specifically is my f- my favorite thing, and I like anything geek. So so when I came across this channel, this is Rosanna Pansino, and she's got 
you know, 167 videos up as of yesterday. And she makes everything that's awesome. Angry from Birds Pizza. Angry Birds Pizza. Right here, here's some more things she did. Um, Tetris cookies. Those are, and she wears this kick-ass Tetris apron. And uh, she made D20 cookies with Felicia Day. So she gets guest stars on um, to come make stuff with her. Um, obviously, she got bigger. You know, she could get more um, awesome people. You're saying she's fat? And No. no. <laughs> and... Uh, She's made. She's done some really cool things, like like this. That that's that looks like mana potions and those, things. Those. That's exactly what it is. It's Diablo <laughs> three potions for the different classes, and it's made using skittles and vodka. So so awesome. for like a party, people can actually drink them. But she's she's done the effort of you know labeling each one. So for the barbarian, she's got this, and and you know she's got spirit, and she's got mana, and she's got fury, and. Yeah. Uh, inaccuracy there are no well last time I played Diablo 3 anyway your second resource you could not recharge with potions uh, you can't yeah Correct. you have to wait for it to recharge yeah. but it's still it's still <laughs> awesome she, she makes but inaccuracy <laughs> she makes it's from Diablo 2 okay <laughs> she makes Acceptable. awesome things she, she's as you can see she's made the, the the Super Mario stars cake pops she's made Minecraft cakes she makes just anything and everything that's geeky and nerdy and I had to Pull myself away from the channel. Um, it had nothing to do with the fact that my laptop's battery was about to die. Um, Coincidental at best. Coincidental at best. But it's kick ass. So if, if, if nobody, you know, if you haven't taken a look at this, go check her out. It's Rosanna Pansino um, on YouTube. But just Google for um, nerdy nummies and, and, and enjoy all the awesome. My only problem with this yourself. is that I know I've heard of her before, and I'm thinking it's Day Nine has linked me to her before. <laughs> so that's that's a weird abstraction. Yeah. Just, Cool. Well, that brings us to the end of the Quick Geek. And, and that makes us hungry. <laughs> yes. And we're going to talk about some events coming up. So first up, uh, the MediaTek Expo is in full swing at the Coca-Cola Dome. It's running from the 17th to the 19th of July. So by the time you hear this, it will probably be too late. But we have reminded you, <laughs> so you can't blame us for missing it. And it's very likely that in next week's show, Johan is going to give us a rundown of everything that he saw at MediaTek, which is... He's there tonight, and that's why he's not here with us. Yep. Then uh, something else coming up this week is Mandela Day. And uh, for those of you who are maybe not South African um, or or haven't come across this before, what this is about is in in honor of Mandela's 67 years of service, um, though I'm sure it's actually longer than that, but it's a great number regardless. Um, uh, the, The idea is that every South African offers 67 minutes of their time for a cause that they wish to support um so um yeah so one minute of action for each of the 67 years madiba spent serving the people of south africa right, so to and nelson mandela day or also known as international nelson mandela day actually um, are making, is, are, is it going global it is an it's international day oh yeah um it's not a public holiday no. but it is his birthday as well um, not yet <laughs> no, 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 it's I his mean, birthday. Tomorrow, oh, yeah. Yeah. July eighteenth oh, yeah. is his birthday and so you know he'll never see this but uh happy birthday madiba for tomorrow Mm. So what are you doing? Do you have any plans? I am serving the my broadband community as best I can as I do every day. That sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> do you have anything more awesome planned? I wouldn't have had anything specific planned, but uh, I'm sure someone will find something for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> our, uh, our work is having an event. Um, we're, we're doing a very large thing involving Dimension Data, Internet Solutions, and a whole lot of other companies at the campus. And uh, we're going to walk for 67 minutes and we're going to pay to walk so you know yeah it's what 67, 67 rand, rand 60, 67 minutes yeah. yeah cute fun walks yeah yeah not really community service but it's something yeah yeah well you're raising money and that's going to go to a good cause I yes assume. yes we're going it's donating to two different causes so. yeah cool with that, we're going to go into what geekery is this, and we're going to start off with a bit of a fight happening between Celsi and Vodacom uh, lately um, that's got to do with Celsi's national roaming agreement <laughs> with Vodacom. The image credits I love uh, that picture. <laughs> goes to Quinton uh, Bronkort, who, who works at, at uh, Business Tech. Uh, he puts most of these together for us, um, and obviously that's shooped on top of uh, <laughs> an actual boxing shot. But um, That the, still looks brilliant. It's great. <laughs> Um, and so what's, what's happening here is uh, Celsi has been having network issues. And so in a call with Alan Not Craig, uh, that's obviously one of the questions that needed to be asked was people are complaining loudly about network problems on Celsi. I'm one of them. Yeah, what is going on? 
And he said that the majority, the main issue they have is the fact that they are not handing over seamlessly. So, uh, yeah, so they're not handing over seamlessly to the Vodacom network from Cell C and vice versa. And cell handover is what happens when you move from one cell of coverage to another cell of coverage. If, you, um, if you've got any sort of basic understanding of how cellular networks work, you've got little masts that create bubbles of coverage, if you will. And uh, you move between them, right? So that, that's why it's called a cellular network. It's, it's a network based on cells rather than a satellite network, which creates like a blanket footprint um, from, the, from the stars. Which is also cells, but that's another… It's one massive cell. Well, we can go into this later. But. <laughs> yes, uh, well, the, the various transponders. Fair <laughs> yeah. enough. Fair enough. Um, so, um, but the thing about a cell network is it's terrestrial and you need to be able to be, to, to be mobile between them. Well, you it's have to be able to switch. Yes. Mobile phone network, yep. right? Okay. So, basics of um, handover handled. So, now seamless handover is when you're on a call and you, let's say you're in the car. Why are you talking on your phone in the car, idiot? Stop it. Um, and That's freak it. <laughs> you move from one cell into another, but you stay on the call. Right. That's seamless handover. If the handover is not seamless, your call drops. And so, for example, the distinction between Neotel's network, which is a CDMA network, and CDMA is a technology that's used in cellular networks all the time, like Verizon Wireless and the U.S. uses CDMA, but they have seamless handover. Neotel does not. And that is what makes oh, them wow. a fixed wireless network as compared to a mobile network Amongst other things, but that's the big one uh, and the one that people usually refer to when, when we're talking about uh, seamless handover. All right, so um, what Celsi is saying uh, is that this is now not happening. When, uh, and Celsi customers can roam onto the Vodacom network, right, right. Uh, where there's no Celsi coverage. But when you roam onto the Vodacom network, the handover is not seamless. Okay, if you're still with me, this is where the interesting stuff starts, Okay. Bit of background. So <laughs> now the problem uh, is uh, – so the first question that came up when Alan Not Craig said this was, but hang on a second. You've had this roaming agreement with Vodacom for years. So what's changed? And the answer is nothing. Uh, oh, zing. <laughs> yeah. So, so Vodacom has not changed the way it handles its national roaming. Cels and, and, um, and Cels confirmed this. They said, no, nothing's changed. They're, it's just their requirements that have changed. So for the last year, Alan Not Craig said, he's been, tr he's been trying to negotiate with Vodacom to give them seamless handover along with their national roaming which has existed and their national roaming agreement with Vodacom is going to be uh, it, it's going to be there for at least another few years and he said that uh, he or he didn't say so in so many words but he basically <laughs> indicated that um, Vodacom was not too receptive to their requests and so after a year of trying this he said right. he's lost his patience and um, he reached out to the regulator the regulator indicated that uh, th uh, that's ICASA, by the way, um, indicated that this is something that would fall under their jurisdiction. And so Celsius is going to lay a complaint with ICASA oh. to try and force Vodacom to do seamless handover uh, with Celsius. So my next question, obviously, was, hang on I a second. I approve of this battle. <laughs> <laughs> How technically feasible is that? Because you're talking about two different networks, probably different yep. vendors. Can this be done? Mm. And according to Not Craig... Indeed, it can, and it has been done in other countries. Okay, he says okay. it's easier than it sounds. And so what happens in a, in a, in a cell phone network that's not homogenous necessarily, but uh, because not, most cell networks in South Africa are, in fact, not homogenous. You've got Nokia Siemens Networks equipment, Ericsson equipment, Huawei equipment, ZTE equipment that all need to talk to one another, right? So, right. Uh, but he says that um, what you do in a cell network is you tell a tower or a site which – um, which cells are its neighbors. Okay. And so when somebody is exiting the cell, you, you can tell it how to hand over how to hand onto over. this neighbor. Yeah. Right. Um, it's a, it obviously configuration and that sort of stuff. It's not trivial, um, but that's how it's done. And he says whether it's on your own network or somebody else's network, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, n it's not an issue. Um, right. So it's, it's the same principle that applies to, to do that. So according to Not Craig, it's technically feasible. Vodacom can do this, um, and they're just not doing it. For, it just for sounds like reason. you have to peer your devices correctly. Um, um, your, your sites. Um, yeah. 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 yeah That's what it sounds like. So yeah. it's probably, a, it's probably going to be a it's, lot of configuration <laughs> on the imagine, Vodacom yeah. side, which maybe they don't feel like, and maybe one can understand why they wouldn't. Um, but that's why you renegotiate yeah. an agreement, right? right. Just to say, yes. all right, so if you want to charge it's us in everyone's for this, best interest. Yeah. Um, then, or if, you know, if you want something from us for this, you know, what is it? Yes. And let's just get this done. Um, so interesting. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but that said, 
I still don't see how this necessarily translates to the data throughput problems right. that Celsius or have. the lack thereof. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've asked not Craig that, and he says they have actually over the last three months addressed their data capacity problems. Um, I have not noticed a difference <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so I'm, I'm definitely, now that I've got this um, 99 Rand SIM for the Red Bull Mobile uh, promotion thing, I'm definitely going to, because my Celsius um, bundle I had has expired, I'm definitely going to give them a spin, see if anything's different. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know that this speaks to their backwall problems. You know, when, when, no, you, yeah. when it says you've got full signal, you're connected to HSPA, but you're not getting any throughput. But maybe it could be. Um, so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to speculate about that. But the fact is, I, I just don't see it right now. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe you know they turn on this uh, seamless handover thing, and it's all magically fixed, and and it was all true in the end. Um, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll hope so because yeah. I, you know I have a lot of colleagues at work who have just been complaining the last while that since they moved to Celsi, you know, their calls are dropped, and that I think I actually messaged you earlier this week um, and said, you know. My, my colleagues are complaining about Sal C. You should do an article about it. And you were like, oh, uh, yeah, just did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say as, as a user of Sal C, my, only, my greatest frustration more has to do with uh, certain numbers. You just can't call them. You, you get dropped instantly. Oh, wow. And uh, it beeps at you, and that's it. That's all you get. Um, you can SMS those people, but you can't call them. Yeah. I've had issues like that on MTN um, oh. as well. So, uh, yeah, it does happen on, on networks, and, and hopefully it's, it's temporary rather than, than a, than a uh, permanent yeah. issue. But, yeah, I mean, it does happen. It happens on… Well, as long as they're addressing it. I'm cool with that, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so interesting question coming from the comments. Um, what capacity are they paying for and have Celsi undersubscribed on backhaul links to save on costs? And uh, good questions all. And I guess we'll see. Um, yes. it, uh, we, so um, while we're on the topic, Celsi has recently announced that they've received a cash injection to the tune of 5.7 billion. Good that grief. is a lot of zeros. Yes. A lot of money. Um, uh, and and not, not, a, not a South African billion, but a, but a you know, like uh, a billion uh, that everybody else talks about. A US about. billion. No, well, 1,000 million. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Um, and that comes from 3.5 billion is mm. direct uh, equity investment from Oja Telecom, their parent. And 2.2 billion of that is in loans. That's a lot of loans. Oh, that's wow. a lot of interest. Yes. Um, but that's coming via NetBank um, and organized by NetBank, but uh, run through the Development Bank of South Africa and a bunch of other lenders as well. So... And he said that they're going to put that money towards growing the network um, and, you know, rolling out more sites and, and so on and so forth. And I asked them, so, you know, what about, what about capacity? And he said that their focus is on improving the network um, and they're obviously going to be growing capacity. But it doesn't sound like, um, you know, the majority of this money is going to go to capacity. And maybe you don't need to throw a lot of money at capacity to get good backhaul. Um, so maybe that's what's happening there. But um, the fact is that, uh, you know, the, it sounds like the majority of this money is being pumped into the network, whether that's backhaul, whether that's um, sites, towers, whatever the case might be, um, uh, that's what they're pumping this money into. You've made me now think of maybe some of the issues we just have is that the uh, cells are con congested even. So uh, that, that's, the, that's the general feel that I get because mm. um, there's a lot of people who complain about on-network calls, you know, Celsi yes. to Celsi, where it doesn't involve another network or handover. And there was just a lot of people who said no, but that handover, when, when Celsi first dropped their rates and did that big market upset, you know, people started to move over to Celsi and their, their quality was good. And now that the whole world and his, his dog have, have ported to Celsi, there's just too many people and the network can't handle it. Yeah. And I guess this is where this money comes in. Yes. Is to is to help. Um, so what I can tell you, um, though, I want to turn this into an article later. So I hope it doesn't get out. Um, but he did tell a bunch of journalists. So this is yeah. bound to get out sooner or later. He told us that they are rolling out over a hundred sites a month. That's significant. That's new sites that they're putting up. That's not. I'm not going to back. Okay, but anything. are these like urban sites or are these uh, links or are these no, no sites, sites. Okay. So an actual radio access network okay, site okay, that okay. they're putting up. Um, so and and then that's in various locations. Um, so wherever they can, I think environmental improvements are always a sticky thing. And then yeah, you've right. got in some communities, you've got people who say we don't want towers. Um, uh, Celsi has has got this whole plan to cover. Ninety nine percent of the country by as does everyone. But what they've what they've <laughs> what they've got to do is um, as That's well quite a hefty rate a, as yes. uh, um, not Craig explains that the reason this handover to the Vodacom network has become a problem is because counterintuitively when you 
put up more cell sites, you actually cause more gaps in your network. What you do is, um, you, you know you talked uh, about the cell congestion issue. Yeah. So you know those 900 megahertz sites that they put up? That covers a far larger geographic, or can at least co- cover a far larger geographic area than a, than a higher frequency site. Yes. The like 2100 megahertz, which is what a lot of the other guys use for 3G use. Um, but now, in order to ensure that sites are not overloaded, you shrink them. So you, you, you pack them more densely and you shrink them. But now, you are switching sites more often. You also, um, as more people climb onto the sites, oh, you as, get... As you move faster as well. You every, every handover is yeah. a potential point of failure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, okay. and so okay. and so um, they are, they are uh, in some cases in some areas they are relying on the Vodacom national roaming agreement to just keep people on their voice calls um, while they um, while they you know just wait for them to get back onto the cell C network. So data will be an issue because you only have edge on the Vodacom network. Um, that's the nature of the agreement between cell C and Vodacom. Um, but voice calls, I think, is, is where their biggest concern is. The voice calls should not drop. Well, if it's you're the moving. primary function of the phone. Yeah, right. So um, now, now on top of that, in 3G, you get a phenomenon called cell breathing. What that means is, is that the more people climb onto a cell, the, the smaller its coverage gets effectively. It, it's, it's, if it's effectively, it's not really like that. It's okay. actually, in, in engineering terms, it raises the noise floor. Right. Um, and so that effectively um, decreases the coverage area. Um, and so um, th- that's... Uh, so it's it's as they are adding more sites, this problem gets gets bigger, um, and so that's that's the part. Of, and anyway, so this money oh, is going to go into um, stopping those gaps, is part of the things he said. Uh, is one of the things he said. So this five point seven billion, they want to make sure that this falling off the network and the, the gaps that they've created, they want to fill up those gaps. Um, Anyway, I'm going to move us along a bit. In, in next week's show, we'll cover the difference between a South African billion and everybody else's billion. In the quick geek. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and why milliard is a fine word. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Luke, you came across this and I thought, uh, I thought it was quite interesting. Location pinpointing with three words. Um, so what three words, I think, is the name of the thing. What is that about? What three words is a company who are now – Selling georeferencing points uh, as three arbitrary English words um, so that you can get to a location. So, uh, um, sorry, just a touch flustered. Um, no, no, no problem. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, right, so, so uh, walk, walk me through this. So, they so charge for this. They can charge for it. Uh, if you opt in, so what, they, what they're actually selling is you can, you can bind a location to a name. Uh, that's what they're selling. So you can say, okay, I, I am sportsman. I am going to bind sportsman as my location. But where the, the power of this thing will be is that they've, they've divided the entire planet up into like 57 trillion sectors. Okay. Uh, you can go and flag a spo- point of interest to you, and they will randomly generate for you a three simple word location for and that's a that's a free service. That's a free service. Very cool. So, um, for so this example, is almost like um, you know those uh, uh, link shorteners for Twitter. Yes. For GPS coordinates. Correct. So you, uh, if you if you use the app, um, you can take your GPS coordinates in whatever format they are, be it you know G- GPS or. Uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, or uh, degree, decimal degrees, and those kinds of things. You can just take those and plonk them on a point and say, okay, here's the three words that make up this location. Uh, and now, as someone giving out a location, say, over the phone, now I just say three words, and you know where I am. Yeah. I you can get those GPS reference coordinates back. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's actually a common complaint. I remember my mother-in-law, in fact, being quite upset about the fact that there was seemed to be no unified standard in in geographic coordinate systems uh, or ge- yes. and, and even in a single geographic coordinate system like WGS84, you have degrees, minutes, seconds, decimal degrees, degrees, decimal minutes. Well, even, even without those kinds of complications, I mean, I come from a, like a, a, a military background is what I work in. And now you've even got even more of those things. You know, you have to figure out where you are in like MGP or GRS and, you know, I Think remember of when, it and you have to use it. Yeah, uh, and I remember uh, doing work in Sweden, and Sweden actually uses its own 
projection system yes. for geographic coordinates because it maps. Uh, well, like when you get down to the technical details, it maps Sweden better because Sweden is sitting against the, the, that top curve of the globe. Yes. WGS84, which is what we use here and works quite well close to the equator, yes. um, uh, makes it very difficult uh, or, or at least is not, doesn't give you quite the granularity as it, you know, uh, closer to the poles uh, as it does closer to the equator. So it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting problem, and it's interesting to see somebody trying to solve it um, with almost like a hashing so mechanism. So we have an example, at, at the, uh, if you want to talk about the example. Well, bring it up. Let's show it. So this is the House for Hack location, and its word set is Brighter Depends Waiters, which... Brighter Dependent Waiters. Uh, dependent Waiters. Yes. Uh, which is kind of meaningless, I suppose. But, I mean, over the phone, you could get the location down pat. No problem. So what they do is, as well is in uh, less built-up areas, they use longer names. So the thing can actually take that kind of metric into account. So if you're clicking on a point somewhere in the ocean, it'll give it a fantastically long name. Um, Supercalifragilistic. Yeah, well, it's not that bad, but <laughs> it's but, up but there. Nice and yeah. Long. So um, I thought this was a nice idea. It's it's quirky. I mean, at the moment, it kind of seems niche. What would you use it for? And I see they're trying to sell it as like a postal code replacement as well so that you wouldn't have to know the postal code of the location you're trying to send stuff to you mm. just send here it's that location send it to that spot it, it's you know? a very interesting idea and I, and I guess the problem that these guys might run into is geeks like us deciding we're going to do this for free um, so well, XKCD for example exactly. developed the geo hashing system right. which uh, is not quite as easy to use as something like this but the fact is that um, you know what's stopping us from cobbling together something and giving it away for free on the web uh, for example, I mean, I'm sure it's actually quite it's quite a difficult problem to solve, um, but the fact is that geeks solve difficult problems all the time. And well, put the it thing is, the only on the thing that they're selling at this time is the one word location. So, if you wanted to own the word like Microsoft, you could uh, go and pay I for see. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and for that specific so it's, location, it, it's, it's very interesting. It's sort of like this amalgamation of uh, link shorteners and domain names, yes. all and sort of rolled into it, one. It's, it's basically selling. Uh, a shortened name for a, GPS coordinates. Yes. A handle would be yes, the geeky term. Yes, a handle. Term. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like owning a GPS coordinates handle. Very cool. All right. Good spot, Luke. But it's also, it's also like a marketing thing because if you're selling like supplies, you could say those specific kind of supplies like ink uh, is yours. And then, you, you know, someone searches for, oh, I'm going to look for ink. Uh, there you go. It's your location. Yeah. And they know where you are. Pretty cool. It'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to see how how it gets used, though, and put into practice. Because at the moment, if I tell you, Jan, I'm at Simple Fluffy Cow. <laughs> well, people are going to think you're mad, but uh, that makes it more fun. Um, but he has, it, yeah. to have, he has to have yes. the What Three Words app then and type yes. in Simple Fluffy Cow, and it translates it for him. Um, although I do see an interesting um, application here. If you are trying to send someone. Um, the coordinates to a secret meeting, then you can just whisper three words in their ear while you walk past and. Exactly. Lovers crossing Occupy the field. Occupy Centurion. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can but, organize uh, that. I'd say the only thing that's lacking in the system is because it's brand new, there's not very many points. So, I mean, I would type in like Centurion and there's one point. So I'm like, this is unacceptable. <laughs> Added my own. <laughs> so. All right, no. cool. Um, with that, we're going to go into uh, a, a, just something cool we like to end the show off with. And Annie, you discovered this. So uh, this is from a geeky girl, and it's awesome. Um, and it's a very nerdy love song played on a ukulele, assisted by an adorable kitten. Now, to, to avoid any copyright issues um, with YouTube, we're not going to uh, play you the, actual, the actual song and the actual video, but it will be in the show notes. But I can tell you a little bit about it. Yep. Um, so comedian and folky songstress Diane Smith um, was doing a video for her friend of hers in which she sings this very nerdy love song. And uh, she had a problem. Uh, her problem was an incredibly persistent, insanely adorable fluffy kitten named Clark who undertakes a relentless campaign to help her with her ukulele playing. And he pretty much, you know, he climbs all over the, the ukulele while she's trying to play. It's, it's, they say the end result is equal parts hilarious and equal parts awe. So 
I just like that there's a mini rant in the song as well. So that's <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, on the on the on the use. Uh, I mean, this yeah. is this is how awesomely nerdy it is. Is she rants about the, how to use farther and further? Yeah. Um, <laughs> in the middle of the song, but and, and the validity of certain words in Scrabble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's good fun and uh, and uh, definitely I think would make any <laughs> nerd's heart <laughs> pump. Uh, Galactic chocolate or pan galactic <laughs> <laughs> gargle blasters or some geeky thing. Uh, so go Very check nice. it out. Her channel is the real Deanne, and uh, we'll we'll link to it as well because yeah, it's that'll be in the show notes. It's cute and fun. Yeah. With that, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be in the IRC after the show chatting to the folks that joined us live. You can join us live next time, uh, live.ltnet.tv. We announce stuff on Twitter at Let's Talk Geek, and we'll tell you when the, when the next show is live. You can also follow us on Facebook and Google+. Plus. You can check out our other shows, and you can watch us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash LT Star Network. Um, and with that, I don't think it's fair to leave without letting people know where you can find us. Luke, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at FRK. Yeah. Frick yeah. Uh, don't try anywhere else. I really don't use that <laughs> other stuff. Um, what about email, man? <laughs> <laughs> Annie, where can people find you? Yeah, you can also find me on Twitter at AnnieBugZA. Um, I'm also the admin for the at Let's Talk Geek Twitter handle. Uh, and yeah, or you can email me, the mixer at let's talk network dot TV. Spam from multiple fronts. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Jan Vermeulen. I work for my broadband on CZA and spend most of my online time there. I'm also on Twitter at Jan VZA. And occasionally I post stuff to Facebook and Google Plus. You can search for me there and whatever it is they do on those nowadays, circling and following. And it's all very complicated. Twitter is just. <laughs> you click the follow button and it yeah. happens I like this content click there we go I'm going to get more of it <laughs> done exactly cool with that thanks so much we'll catch you again next time thank you cheers <laughs>